I want to talk to us a little bit about, since you ask, because someone pray about, you know, you always ask God to, what am I supposed to speak and all this. So since you ask, and this is several questions that I've gotten over the years and uh, some of the top ones. I got to thinking about it later. I'm like, man, I could do this three, four or five times and not get, uh, you know, because there are certain questions that just come up over and over and over again. And so we're just going to look from it biblically. And uh, that's my commitment to you is everything we do is going to be biblical. Hallelujah. So First uh, Peter 3.15 says this. And if you want to stand in honor to, to the reading of the word of God, First Peter 3.15 talks about answering questions. It says, but sanctify, if you don't mind, let's everybody say sanctify. sanctify, sanctify. That means set apart the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. It doesn't see, you're not supposed to be mean about it. You're not supposed to be cocky about it. You're not supposed to be prideful about it. But let's read that again and point out just a few things about it. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. So it's God in us that does this. And be ready always. So this means be instant in season and out of season to do this. To give an answer to every man. So everybody deserves to hear about the hope that ride, resides within us. That asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you. And also, as I've already mentioned, do it with meekness and in fear. Do it with a kind spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. So let's pray, ask God to do everything he wants to do here tonight. God, it's not my words, it's your word, God. And it's your spirit, not my spirit. And God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, cleanse us by the word. Let the Holy Spirit, God, give us life, truth, that more abundantly. And God, let us all receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. And God, we just give you all the glory, the honor, the adoration, the thanksgiving, the praise. It all belongs to you, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. And why don't we just glorify the Lord for his word tonight? His word is good. It's creative. It's cleansing. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, why don't you turn to your neighbor and just say, God is good. God is good. And you can be seated in the name of the Lord. So since you asked, <laughs> many of you have asked about many of these things over the years. I was telling Sister Waldron, today, uh, today is my dad's 93rd birthday. If he was here, he'd be 93. And it's also our 14th year anniversary of, uh, I think, getting voted in at New Life 14 years ago. If you can believe that, hallelujah. Time flies when you're having fun. So I must be having a blast because it seems like three years ago. Hallelujah. It seems not 14 years. Um, and also we've been in our house, I think, eight years. So a lot of anniversaries today. But for, per, First Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us when people ask. So the first question you get, you know, in a Pentecostal church, one of the first questions people get, and it's kind of controversial. People get all up in arms about it. My response is, it's just in the Bible. You know, just look in the Bible. It's got nothing to do with my opinions and everything else. This is all about the Bible. So what's the deal about hair? What's, you know, people ask, what is the deal about hair? Now, you would think in the year 223, with society collapsed the way it has, that people would begin to understand, say, that's why that's in the Bible. That's what people mean about hair. But you might say, what are you even talking about about hair? Well, in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse number 3, some would say even before that, but 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse number 3, we have several verses about hair. Now, the first thing we want to notice is that that's in the New Testament. And it's in the epistles. And what are epistles? Apostles' wives. No, that's a joke. Epistles are letters written to the church, right? All right, so this means it's for us. So uh, a lot of people try to say, well, it was a cultural thing. Well, there's no indication it was a cultural thing. As a matter of fact, he keeps talking about creation. He goes back to Adam and Eve. He goes back, this is the way things are from creation. So it looks like this is just the way things were. We do know from archaeology, actually, this was the way things was even outside the church in a lot of the Mediterranean world also. And the basic thing is, 
Let's just skip down to verses 14 and 15 because we don't want, well, unless God just kind of leads that direction in a rabbit trail. But, um, but we don't want to spend the whole time here. But, you know, so what's the deal about hair? So this is in the New Testament. This is for us today. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. People say, well, didn't Jesus have long hair? And that's actually pictures beginning about the 7th century A.D. But nowhere in the Bible does it say Jesus had long hair. And uh, the only men in the Bible that would have long hair would be Nazarites. And which proves the rule. That the rule is it's God's will for men not to have long hair, just as it says here. Because if it's the exception of Nazarites, if everybody had long hair, then what did it mean to be a Nazarite? You know? So obviously men have short hair. So does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. And uh, so overall, as a general rule of thumb, I know we're 6,000 years from creation, but uh, men... Men's hair grows three quarters of an inch a month. Women's hair grows about an inch and a half a month. And this is all just averages. And men, obviously, even though there are women that have it, and there's men that don't have it, but men overall statistically by far have what's known as male pattern baldness. And uh, I saw a funny thing about that recently. You know, AI, they're saying AI is going to rule the world. We're going to let AI make every decision. So AI was running the cameras at a soccer match and it caught a referee's bald head and it followed it the whole match because it thought it was the ball. <laughs> so they're like, this is the thing that's going to run the world? <laughs> they can't tell the difference between a bald head and a soccer ball? So you have to watch technology sometimes. But anyhow, so but that guy had male pattern baldness. And then verse 15, but if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. And if you were to go back, you would see that the definition of long hair, verse 6, is just uncut hair. Because we know through DNA, not everybody's hair grows the same. So God's not going to be unjust and make some people's, you know, all oh, well, people that have hair like Crystal Gale, you know, flowing the floor and all this. Um, they're no better. It's just uncut hair. And so that's the deal about hair. And it's a New Testament principle. And uh, people are like, well, but I don't like that. You know, all I can do is tell you, pray, read the Bible, talk to Jesus, because it's in the Bible. Amen. And, uh, well, I like people who twist the scripture and take it out of the Bible. Well, you're on the wrong side then. In that case, uh, that's not what uh, Christians who love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's not what we do. We just try to say, what does the Bible say? And regardless of convenience and all of this other stuff, we just try to obey the Bible. They're like, why don't other churches do it? Well, why don't other churches? baptized in Jesus name. I don't know if other churches receive the Holy Ghost. Why don't other churches worship a bunch? You know, there's a lot of things. So you can't go by the other, because we don't do, we don't say, oh, well, I'm going to get my theology about from other churches. That's a wrong thing. That's the, I'm going to do what the majority does. And Jesus is very clear. The majority is not right. <laughs> You know, we're trying to make them right to the help of the Holy Ghost. We want everybody to get the love of God. So really, that's the first thing. Since you ask, <laughs> that's the first thing. That's the deal about hair is hairs to be uncut on women. And it's supposed to be short with men. And we could go into definition. Again, if this was just all about that, you go about pulling your head and why it's supposed to be over your ears for men and all this kind of stuff. So. There's more, ver you know, you get to Revelation, you've got the, the locust, it says they have the hairs, the hair of women. Well, if men and women have the same kind of hair, then what does that even mean? So obviously women have long uncut hair. And so that's biblical. And that kind of leads us into this. Since you ask, uh, what's the deal with distinction in clothing? Now, I would think, again, the way America and the world has collapsed, a lot of these answers would already be answered, if you know what I'm saying. It's uh, one thing to just kind of fight them and get all stiff-necked and all this about other things. But now that this is so in the news constantly that people would say, ah, that's why God put that in the Bible. Because if it wasn't in the Bible, whoo! And so since they took the Bible out of culture and society, 
people are doing just like the sinful nature and Satan does. So God created us male and female. And so God likes a distinction between male and female. And it's not just on hair. There's 1,500 genetic differences between male and female if you want to follow the science of it. But so the distinction in clothing. We'll go to uh, Deuteronomy 22.5 for that one. And you might say, well, pastor, that's in the Old Testament. It is. But you know, same God from the Old Testament, same God in the New Testament. And so he didn't change. It was a sin to lie in the Old Testament. It's a sin to lie in the New Testament. It's a sin to commit adultery. It's a sin to commit adultery in the New Testament. It's a sin to commit idolatry. It's a sin to commit idolatry in the New Testament. So God, He's the Lord. He changes not. All right. So there were certain things fulfilled in Jesus. Why we don't do sacrifices and things. But the moral standard is actually higher, right, in the New Testament, Jesus said. He said, in the Old Testament, you, you know, uh, don't kill. In, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, don't be angry with your brother without a cause. A lot of the modern translations, by the way, take out without a cause that makes Jesus a sinner because later it says Jesus looked around about them with anger. And so that's it, really a big deal. Okay. So let's look at Deuteronomy 22.5. Also something that's an abomination in the Old Testament is an abomination in the New Testament. God hates it universally. So 22.5, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. Now I think that really goes into a lot of our culture today, if you've been keeping up with it any at all. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. So notice that pertains to a man so men have their particular garment which traditionally been pants obviously and neither shall a woman a man put on a woman's garment which is traditionally uh, a dress for many reasons you know and for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God and so people say well since you ask well that's where that comes from and this is why overall in the apostolic church we try to give those distinctions and so, you know some people don't have an understanding about that they don't have a, a conviction about that yet you know they don't have all that we love everybody we give everybody grace to learn amen. and to get amen because uh you know you got one finger pointing at somebody else you got three fingers pointing back at yourself so i've known a lot of people that just ah and then they have a problem tithe paying or something else you know what i'm saying so we just love everybody we want Want everybody to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Five-year-olds don't always know calculus. <laughs> As a matter of fact, most of them don't. <laughs> but uh, by the time they're third year in college and they have to take college calculus, they get it. So that's the way it is growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But since you ask, that's what that's all about. And then another question, and by the way, the whole message is not on these things. This is just the first few things. And I really did pray, you know, God, what do you want me to talk about tonight because we could have went and we may still get into dinosaurs and giants and all kinds of stuff because we get those questions a lot too did angels really marry people in the old testament you know did fallen angels marry uh, women in the old testament we get that question a lot too but uh you know the third thing we'll look at tonight's first hair second's distinction and clothing third is on jewelry what is the deal about jewelry and, uh, you know, first of all, you have to realize that when you find Satan described in Ezekiel 28, he is covered with uh, jewels. And so, and also jewels primarily come from the ground. And so it kind of uh, connects us to the earth. But not only that, we come back to the New Testament. We've got some New Testament scriptures on this. And number three, jewelry, number four, modesty, they all kind of play in together here. And uh, so verse 9, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. That's how they're supposed to dress, modest apparel. And modest merely means long and loose. Modest apparel. It actually in Greek is a Roman garment that means to cover most of the upper arms and below the knee and be loose. And uh, so modest apparel with shamefacedness, and this is, and this is not because you ask, but we do get asked this. This is why um, following scripture, mature apostolic women don't wear makeup because shamefacedness, you can't wear makeup and be shamefaced at the same time. It's two different things. And uh, sobriety, that means you don't dress in wild style because I've seen a lot of people that try to be legal 
but they dressed in the most wild styles it's trying to still be worldly so that's why it says sobriety don't try to draw attention to yourself try to draw attention to Jesus they say the general rule of thumb with modesty is to draw attention to your face which is shame faced because if you're trying to draw attention to other parts of your body that's not good that's going to breed uh, and let me just say this this is in I, I feel like you're receiving it well I mean this is just basic Christianity um, if you go back to the 1960s when I was born it was every denomination taught what I'm take, teaching you tonight yeah. it just didn't matter it didn't matter what if you went where you know Baptist Methodist Lutheran wherever they're gonna be teaching this right. you know so because it's where it's in the New Testament <laughs> And so it's, people say, well, it's cultural. Well, how is that cultural? It's, Paul told Timothy, this is what everybody to do. It doesn't say the women in Ephesus. We find he's in Ephesus when you're reading here. And so it's for everybody. Um, with sobriety, not with broided hair. That means in intertwining things in the hair. Or gold or pearls or costly array. And so he, God even cares about how much our, our clothes cost. Because we need to be wise with our money. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let's go to one more passage on that too. And uh, it's back in 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3. Beginning at verse number 2. Because again, we see society. Society, the, one of the things about the end time, it said people be lovers of their own selves. And so we live in a looks consumed society. Amen. looks consumed. There's filters on our social media to make you look good, make others look good. And we want, you know, we want the perfect body. You know, who ever even heard of a six pack years ago? Now everybody's just got to have the six pack. Well, if you're going to get one, you got to show it off, which is not modest, you know, and, and these type things. And so people are just consumed with uh, their body which we are body soul and spirit but we should glorify God in our body yes. and uh, all right so verse 2 first Peter 3 2 while they behold your chaste if you don't mind let everybody say the word chaste okay. that means sexually moral so we should never dress in a way and it's talking specifically to women but of course this applies to men as well okay. we should not dress in a way that attracts members of the opposite sex or members of the same sex, and that should go without saying. Uh, chaste conversation, your chaste lifestyle, your whole lifestyle should be non-sexual. That's reserved for your spouse, all right? Your, so your chaste or non-sexual lifestyle coupled with fear, that means you want to do good. You're like, okay, I want to make sure I'm doing good. Not what can I get away with, quit telling me I'm not doing right. I want to make sure I'm doing right. That's coupled with fear. Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair. That, once again, is entwining things in the hair. There's amazing examples of this in archaeology and of wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. Now, it's funny to me. People sit there and say, oh, well, that means you're not supposed to wear clothes. No, it means, obviously, through the context, it's apparel that is going to violate chastity and these type things. And so... I, I just had an apostolic telling me. I was like, oh, come on. You know better than that. You, you know how to interpret the Bible. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible. So what kind of ornaments are, are apostolic people supposed to wear, apostolic women? Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So, uh, for after this manner in old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. That's how they look good, being in subjection unto their own husbands. So, you say, well, I, I know this apostolic lady doesn't do that, and this apostolic, none of that matters in the least. They should be doing it, but what matters is what does the Bible tell us to do? Right. All right. So, since you ask, now number five is on Bible translations. Since you ask, <laughs> What's the big deal about Bible translations? 
kind of shifting gears here. What is the big deal about Bible translation? Well, Jesus, he said that we're, he was going to preserve every jot and tittle of the law. These are important. This is like dotting of the I, crossing of the T. Yeah. Uh, Paul, he said, man, it matters. He said, God said seed, singular, not seeds, plural. He's arguing over a letter. So you got parts of letters, letters, and then words. Jesus said, my words are not going to pass away. Till heaven and earth pass away. My words are not going to pass away. So we're supposed to be so in love with the word of God that we're concerned about parts of letters, letters, and words. And so... Uh, modern translational theory basically says that God inspired the word, lost it for 1,800 years, and then people are finding it in scraps trying to reproduce it. That's modern critical theory. And obviously the Bible itself, bibliology, tells that the words of the Lord are pure words, perfect. The words of the Lord are perfect. Yeah. Psalm 19. Amen. This didn't happen. The words of the Lord endureth for ever. ever. Just like truth. That's why we know there's always been a church since the day of Pentecost till now. Acts 38 church. That's not what happened. You had God gave the word and then it's been used by true believers in hundreds of languages throughout the world from then until now. And so it seems like in the English language, how God has preserved it is in the King James version of the Bible. Many there's Chinese King James, so-called there's Spanish King James, so-called on and on and so forth, which we do entire lessons on that. This is just a since you ask it five minute answer or something or less. So that's the big deal about Bible translations. Now you can use other translations, but you know, kind of use them as I say, use a like a Bible storybook or like a commentary. Like you run across something like what in the world? Because there are archaic words in the King James. There just are. That's just a fact. There's like between eight, 600 and 800 archaic words. Now you can get you a little 65 cent. We pass them out here periodically. Um, definitions or you can get the defined Bible. Or a lot of Bibles will have a little definition at the end of the verse, you know, that kind of thing. Those are all good. Uh, but it's better to have an accurate Bible to base your doctrine on. And these others just to use or whatever. Just be very careful because they, they do remove things. And these are ancient corruptions of Scripture. And they were done by people who had false doctrine. They were trying to bring their false doctrines into the church. So that's the deal about Bible translations. Uh, so since you ask... <laughs> What's the deal about creation versus evolution? Why does it matter? Hasn't science proved evolution? Of course, science has not proved evolution, not in the least. And uh, the Big Bang, that's what uh, Sister Hackenbrook was talking about on Sunday, that the Hadron Collider there at CERN in Switzerland is trying to prove the Big Bang. And what it is, is... Uh, if you prove the Big Bang in their mind, you say God doesn't exist. So she said the second time she went, she was showing her parents that. I don't think she said this over the pulpit. I think she said this to Sister Alder and I. And she said that the Holy Ghost hit her. She had to go in the bathroom, begin to intercede and cry. Had to call somebody because she saw the demonic spirit of it all. That it's just, it's all set up to disprove the Bible. So here's the deal about creation and evolution. If Genesis 1 is wrong, the rest of the Bible is wrong. Yeah. Okay. The whole rest of the Bible is the restoration of what Adam and Eve lost in the garden. Genesis chapter 3. If there's no first Adam, Jesus is called multiple times the second Adam or the last Adam. Okay. Come on. Well, if there was no first Adam, how is there a last Adam? If, there's no, if there was no fall, there's no need for restoration. Yeah. Man can save themselves. So it's a big deal. Yes, it is. And you say, well, the colleges and the professors and all this, 
you know, I'm just going to stick with the Word of God. And it's brought me this far. And I encourage you to stick with the Word of God too. And did you know that there are thousands and tens of thousands of creationist scientists? Like the uh, leading biologist alive, his name's James Tor from Baylor University. He is a creationist. and But he's not alone. There's so many. I'm thinking of one guy um, that had three PhDs, considered to be one of the greatest scientists the last several years. He was also a creationist. But so many. I know Ken Ham was just in town Sunday night, I believe it was. I appreciate a lot of the ministry he does. But creation and evolution, and it's destroying our society, it's destroying our country, because young people are just saying, well, I, I just come from protoplasm, I come from blobs, I'm of no special value. Christianity teaches you're in the image of God, and God loves you so much, He became a human being to save you. It does away with racism. You know, evolution says, well, certain skin colors evolved better and all this. And uh, mm -mm. in the Bible, we all came from Adam and Eve. And so there's no racism in the body. And so it's a huge deal. And so don't let people say, well, I'm a Christian, but I also believe in evolution. If you follow that down the path, it doesn't work. <laughs> It just doesn't work. So that's the big deal about that. We've only got three or four more to go. I threw in a fourth one a little bit of go when I was praying. We'll see if we get to it. I hope this is okay. And uh, anyhow, so uh, now that you ask, I get asked, how do you get a position in church? <laughs> you know, people are like, well, I want to be used here. I want to be used there. I want to be used hither, tither, and yon. Well, first of all, pray and uh, pray that God, but second, you know, the, it's God's will because some people have a desire for position. It's not God's will for them to do. And uh, the next thing is, is, is meet the biblical requirement. Meet the biblical requirement to have a position in church. And so, as I jokingly say a lot, this is not open mic night. This is not open karaoke night. Um, a king, Uzziah, said, well, I want to offer a sacrifice. God struck him with leprosy. Two priests, Aaron's sons, went in to offer strange fire before the Lord. God killed them. So you've got, it's got spiritual qualifications, biblical qualifications for this. And so we talk about some of these, not the prayer part, not the born again of water and spirit part, but in the first four or five since you ask. But obviously we want our young people and we want our society, we want the world to be salt. And, we're supposed to be salt and light. We want them to see a godly example in every position. Now, I've got friends of mine, they're just like, I'm putting everybody in every position, it don't matter. It's going to destroy their church. Okay. It just is. Because the church is a spiritual organization. Of course, any of us can build an organization, but God will build His church. Amen. So we have to do the things that are of God. And so we have to meet the biblical requirements, right? Amen. First Peter 3, it says, this is what a bishop is. This is what a deacon is. It does this. And so it, it goes on and on and so forth. So that's how you get a position in church. You pray, ask God, um, and then you fulfill the requirements. You know, well, I want to be a doctor. I hope you go to med school for eight years. Because you don't just get to be a doctor because you want to be a doctor. Um, People talk about standards. I'll just go into this, and this is not in the notes, but people do this all the time. People are like, well, I just don't like standards. I'm like, yes, you do. And they're like, no, I don't like standards. Yes, you, everybody. There's not a person that doesn't like standards. Not a person. Um, the pew you're sitting on was built to specs. Could you imagine if we didn't have any standards with the pews? They would be all, it looked like a Picasso painting. <laughs> Just cubist art, you know. And it may not hold our body weight if it's not built to standards. I'm glad this building was built. To, if this building wasn't built to standards, it would look like some modern art and it would fall. Yeah, because it's built to standards. Aren't you thankful your car's built to standards? Aren't you glad the electrical work here is built to standards? Well, no, we'll just hook this wire to this wire. 
You know, boom, it blows up, kills somebody, burns the church down. Everybody believes in standards. I don't mean you know, I, I, your shoes. I wear about 10 and a half, 11, something like that. Well, I, I'm glad that one's not a 12 and one's not a 4. Okay. Because there's standards out there. Okay. There's, I'm glad that I can trust they're made out of basically the same material. Okay. Well, you walk in one, one just falls apart. Yeah. So everybody believes in standards. It's what you're saying is, is the Bible said it and my rebellious human nature don't like it. And that's what you mean. Because if you're humble and meek and lowly and saying, God, I'll do anything for you. Yeah, you'd probably be okay. Because we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So everybody believes in standards. I have people like at other churches. And they'll come up to me about standards, you know, at an apostolic church, biblical church, and all this, holiness church. And I'll say, well, you have standards at your church. Oh, we don't have any standards. I'm like, really? You let naked people on the platform? Yeah. And they're like, well, no, of course not. Well, then you got a standard. Okay. How about two-piece bikinis? No. Okay. Um, One-piece bikinis? No. I mean, you've got a standard. It's just, do you get your standard from the I want to be a little better than the world? Or is it a biblical standard? That's where it comes in. Because biblically showing your thighs, nakedness, and all this, you know. And so, showing below the collarbone, all of these. And so, um, this, so the key is, do you want to be biblical or do you just want to kind of go along with the pro flow? And, you know, you can kind of go along with the flow for a long time. Fences cannot be fixed for a long time, but eventually they'll wear down. And that's what happens in a lot of churches. They never hear, people never hear about anything like this. And maybe it was a real strong fence at one time, so it takes a long time for it to fall down. But eventually it falls down. All right, so what's the deal with speaking in tongues or speaking with tongues? Well, that's a New Testament experience. We talk about like on hair, all the verses on hair, you know, um, well over a dozen. Well, same with speaking in tongues. You have three entire chapters of the Bible dedicated to it. You've got that everybody basically acknowledges the birthday of the church. You've got people speaking with tongues. So it's an important part of living for God. And so since you ask, that's what it is. And you can try to do all... It's like the hair thing. People try to say, well, I think it's a veil. Have you ever tried to read 1 Corinthians 11 putting veil in there? Because here's what happens. Okay, I have several friends. You may find this a surprise. I have many friends that aren't Acts 238. And uh, so I want them to be, and that's why I'm their friend. You know, I want to do good to all men, the Bible says. And so they're either like, I'll just ignore it and it'll go away. <laughs> That's what they do to first Corinthians. If I ignore it, it'll go away. There's a lot of other verses to preach. I'll just won't preach that one. You know, those verses, you know. Or secondly, well, it was cultural. And it's like, there's no way it's cultural. <laughs> it's all about creation and everything. Then thirdly, it's like, well, it means something, but I'm not sure what it means. And so they'll do the veil thing. I, I actually appreciate people who actually acknowledge that it means something. And don't just ignore it. Okay. And uh, you said, well, pastor, I just don't think it's important. Well, of course, the, the heart, the Bible talks about, cleanse first that which is inside, that the outside may be clean also. Amen. So, of course, God cares about the heart. Yes. I, I've never seen anybody argue that God didn't care about the heart. Okay. You know, that's Phariseeism, just care about the outside and be mean on the inside. And so, I just, I've never seen that argued before. And so... Um, but it means something. And so for people to be honest, because what ends up happening is people just, well, I'll go to a, another church that doesn't believe that. And they teach out of the Bible every week. And, and I'll just kind of, you know, your soul's the most valuable thing you've got. And you need to take the most care for your soul. Let's go. Amen. And you need to see, are these things true? And this is why we're so big. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are taken in captivity for lack of knowledge. And let me just say this. Like, I'm going back to hair here. But did you know, like everybody for 1,850 years or 1,900 years that called themselves a Christian believed exactly what we teach. Amen. We just teach what's always been taught. Amen. And the world shifted. Yeah. Hello. But God is the Lord. He doesn't change. Yeah. 
So you have to say, what does God want? So speaking with tongues. Speaking in tongues is the initial sign or the initial evidence of getting the Holy Ghost. Speaking with tongues is not the sign of the Spirit's continued indwelling. The sign of the continued indwelling is bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Andrew Urshan wrote a wonderful book called The Great Danger of the Pentecostal Movement that he ever said, first of all, he said, if speaking with tongues is ever said to be the evidence of the Holy Ghost, then all is lost because he said the Pope in Rome is going to speak in tongues one time. He fully expected that. We already see the head of the Church of England speaks with tongues, he says, two hours a day. And yet he believes all kinds of strange, unique, anti-biblical doctrines. And so it's the initial sign or the initial evidence, but they don't be followed by bearing the fruit of the Spirit. All right. And uh, lastly, we may go into one more after this, but we'll, we'll say this one's the last, right? The second, what's the deal with expressive worship? Well, we're the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says he seeks such to worship him. Those that will worship him in spirit and truth. If they did that in the Old Testament without the Holy Ghost, New Testament, new birth experience, what more should we do? in expressing our love for Jesus Christ. Jesus created us body, soul, and spirit, so we worship Him body, soul, and spirit. And so we worship Him, express, we lift up holy hands, we clap hands, we dance, we shout, we twirl. If you go in the Hebrew definitions of the words, Jews to this day jump up on tables and worship, and so we are expressive worshipers of Jesus. And uh, that's the deal. So, since you ask, those are nine questions uh, that we had. So, uh, does anybody have a question at this point? Hallelujah. Amen. Why don't we stand to our feet and why don't you find somebody to pray with and just ask God to help us all live biblically and a desire to live biblically and open our hearts and minds to Jesus, His love, and His word. Let's pray together. God, I glorify you. I love you, Jesus. You told us to be ready always to give a reason for the hope that lies within us, God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, open every heart. Let cleansing go forth by the power of the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Ghost, God. 